Hey everyone, I'm Dr. Maxwell Cooper from Benchmark IR, a learning resource for minimally invasive and image-guided procedures. And I'm going to be taking you through these next two videos covering venous access. So Dr. Moon gave a nice overview of vascular access in his previous video, which would include both venous and arterial access. And in these next two videos, we're going to specifically focus on the principles of venous access. So in this video, part one, we're going to focus on central versus peripheral venous access and then tunneled versus non-tunnel catheters. And in the second video, which you can find via the link in the description below, we will cover central venous catheter placement principles and risks and complications. So to kick this off, we'll talk about peripheral venous access. So by definition, this is direct venous access obtained via a non-central vein. And a non-central vein is typically defined as a vein clo in close proximity to the heart. So the SVC, the IVC, the brachiocephalic veins, iliac veins, femoral veins, uh, jugular veins, for example. So for when we're talking about peripheral venous access, we're usually, as it sounds, going to be going through typically in the upper extremity. They can be placed in the lower extremity, but these are kind of the common veins, the cephalic vein, the brachial vein, or the basilic vein, as you can see here in the upper extremity. And this is where either the most common peripheral intravenous catheter, or a PIV, or a midline catheter, which we'll talk about what those are in a second. You know, peripheral venous access via a peripheral IV or midline is kind of the standard access for patients in the following settings, you know, the emergency room, inpatient setting, the operating room or procedure room, if they're getting a CT or an MRI done, you know, and getting IV contrasts, you know, and typically you're going to use, you know, peripheral IV for that. Some of the indications for placing a peripheral IV or a midline is, you know, administering medications, giving blood products such as, you know, transfusing red blood cells or platelets. Uh, or if you need to give fluids. As far as the contraindications, there's no absolute contraindications to placing a peripheral IV or a midline. Some relative ones that you may want to consider on a case-by-case -case basis is if the patient has a coagulopathy, so if they're at risk for developing clots, if there's an infection or trauma at the intended skin insertion site, um, so that can, you know, obviously complicate things. Uh, so you may want to go from a different site uh, than you originally intended. If they have an arterial venous fistula formation, so if they have, you know, like a fistula for dialysis access, you may want to go from a different uh, access point. Or if they have a thrombosis of the vein you're attending to access, uh, you may want to try another aspect. So as far as a peripheral IV goes, it's a short venous catheter placed through a peripheral vein. And you can see this here is a single lumen catheter. It has this kind of short terminal end here that goes through the vein that it's placed in. Again, this is standard venous access. It's usually placed through smaller veins, kind of in the hand or wrist area. And then if needed, if place additional catheters or uh, these veins aren't good for access, you can kind of move up into the forearm or even go into the elbow and even further up. Again, the duration for these is about three days or so. They, they actually need to be replaced about every three or four days. So if a patient's in the hospital for you know one or two days, you know, this can get them through just fine. However, if you're going to have a patient that's going to be uh, for a longer period of time or a patient who's in the ICU, then you may want to use uh, a different catheter. And an example of that would be a midline IV, which is another, again, we're still peripheral venous access here. And it's kind of a mid-length, as it says in the name, peripheral venous catheter placed through a peripheral vein. The key thing is it's still placed through a peripheral vein. Again, what, you know, one of these is the common, either the basilic, the cephalic, or the brachial veins. It typically will terminate around near the axilla here. So it's, you know, comes up here and it's, as you can see, it's a little bit longer than a peripheral IV. And that's really just to help with stability. Again, it's not going to terminate in a central vein. That's by definition a central venous catheter, which we'll get into later. The thing about midlines is they are also able to be used for a longer period of time. So they can be used for at least five days and actually uh, up to a month. The advantage of that is it doesn't need to be replaced as frequently. Again, it's less needle sticks for the patient. The other thing is that if a patient has kind of difficult veins to access and you're worried about losing access, sometimes uh, you'll place a midline as well just to ensure that you don't lose that access in case, you know, things get critical and you would need to, you know, give patients medications or uh, fluids in, a, in, a, in an emergent situation. So some of the limitations of peripheral venous access, again, it's kind of limited to, especially in the peripheral IV case, you know, a few days, a midline is a couple weeks. They're less stable than central venous catheters. They're usually only single, single lumen and smaller, so they can't give as uh, high a volume of fluids or medications. The other thing is we'll talk about with some of the central venous catheters is they have multiple lumens, so you can give more than one medication at a time. The other thing is that peripheral IVs are not ideal for home use. Peripheral IVs can 
come out more easily. Um, they can get damaged more easily. And so with a central venous catheter, it's just more stable and more easier to use for patients at home. So going off that, as far as central venous access, this is defined as direct venous access obtained via a central vein. Again, you know, one of those veins close in close proximity to the heart. The very typical ones are the internal jugular veins here in the neck. Those are very commonly used. You can use the subclavian vein. You can also go down into the legs and uh, use the femoral veins as well. These are common access for patients in uh, a trauma situation because, again, you can give you know, higher volumes of fluid or higher volumes of blood products in these scenarios. Also for patients in the ICU, critically ill in the ER as well. Here's a good example here. This is you know, a non-tunneled catheter. We'll get into tunnel versus non-tunneled in a second here, but this is non-tunneled, placed through the internal jugular vein, terminates at the cavoatrial junction here, uh, right around where the superior vena cava joins with the heart. And so it's a more secure line, and it can be used for longer-term therapy. You can use it for longer than just a few weeks, which is your limitation with a midline or a few days with a peripheral IV. These are usually larger caliber catheters. They usually have multiple lumens, as we can show you here. So here's a single lumen. Here's a double lumen, which is kind of what's shown here. You can see these two different ports for each lumen. So you can give a medication through each, a different medication through each of these ports. You can also have triple lumen catheters as well, as you can see here. And again, like I said, the central venous axis allows for patients to actually go home. So sometimes a patient may be otherwise stable and can go home, but they need to have IV medications uh, given or even IV fluids given at home over a long period of time beyond their hospital stay. And so we can place these catheters for them to go home. So as far as the types of central venous catheters, there's the peripherally inserted central catheter or a PIC line, tunneled versus non-tunneled, and then cuffed versus uncuffed. First, we'll talk about with peripherally inserted central catheter or PIC line, and it's really all in the name. It's, a it's defined as a central venous catheter or central venous access, but it's placed through a peripheral vein. And the reason why is because it eventually will terminate in the central venous system. Again, it can be used for much longer than peripheral venous access. It can be used for weeks or months. The indications for a PIC placement are, again, kind of similar to peripheral IV access. You, if you want to administer medications such as antibiotics, it's a very common use for PIC lines is if a patient needs long-term IV antibiotics, we'll place a PIC line and they can go home and, and administer those IV antibiotics over a long period of time. If you need to give blood products or fluids, repeat blood draws for labs. Some kind of absolute contraindications. If someone has a skin infection or cellulite, such as cellulitis at the access site, you do not want to place a PIC line there because it's just going to get infected or potentially introduce an infection into the bloodstream. The other thing is you always want to review the patient's allergies and see if they have an allergy to the catheter material that you're placing. The other thing with PIC line specifically, since it's peripherally placed, it's placed through a peripheral vein, if a patient is at risk for renal failure or already in renal failure and you think they're probably going to need dialysis, in most cases you don't want to place a PIC line because if you place a PIC line, you risk kind of damaging the veins that could be used for a fistula formation. You know, in that case, you may want to place, you know, a central venous catheter, which is placed through a central vein, which we'll talk about in a second here. Um, and so that's kind of something really important to remember that's kind of unique for PIC lines. Uh, the other thing is if they have an irreversible coagulopathy or if they have a central vein occlusion, uh, that could preclude you from placing a PIC line as well. A PIC line is, like I said, it's placed peripherally. Usually it's placed in the upper extremities. And then again, as you can see in the diagram here, it terminates again at the cavoatrial junction, you know, in the central venous system. And the thing here is that, again, it can be used for weeks to months. And something I want to point out is that, like I said, a PIC line, the term PIC line kind of gets thrown around a lot in the hospital. You'll hear people say, oh, this person needs a tunneled PIC, which really there's no such thing technically as a tunneled PIC. You can only have a tunneled central access or central venous catheter. And so it's just, it's just important kind of when you're ordering these things or communicating these things, it can, you know, just to avoid confusion of what the patient actually needs. It's helpful just to say, you know, either they need a PIC line, which is for peripherally inserted, or if they truly need a central venous catheter, just say, you know, they need a central venous catheter. So now that we get into uh, central venous catheters or CVCs, we're going to talk about tunneled versus non-tunneled. So non-tunneled is what you see here. Non-tunneled means there's no skin tunnel. And so it's placed directly through the skin and then just below that directly accesses the vein. Again, these can be used from days up to a few weeks. And so again, it travels, you know, see, you can see it here entering the internal jugular vein and then traveling in the central venous system here. What's nice about these is since you're not creating a tunnel, these can actually be placed pretty quickly in an emergent situation. 
Again, if a trauma patient comes in uh, and you need to get access to give large amounts of fluids or medications, these can be placed in those scenarios. Common examples of ASCATH, which is often used for dialysis or plasmapheresis. The other advantages of the non-tunneled is you don't need to place these in the angio suite or in the IR suite. You can place these actually at the bedside, you know, either in the ER or on the floor or in the ICU. So some indications for non-tunneled central venous catheters. Again, administering medications uh, such as chemotherapy. Usually you're going to give chemotherapy long-term over a central venous catheter rather than a peripheral venous catheter. Uh, giving antibiotics, blood products, fluids. Again, access for hemodialysis and plasmapheresis. And then uh, blood draws as well for labs. As far as absolute contraindications, again, if they have a skin infection, such as cellulitis at the access site, you may want to try and go from another site. Again, when you're working these patients up, it's always important to examine them, especially the access site where you think you're going to go, just to see if you need to change access site. Again, review the allergies, see if they have allergy to the catheter material. Relative contraindications are irreversible coagulopathy and central vein occlusion. So now tunneled central venous catheters. These are catheters that travel subcutaneously through a skin tunnel before entering the venous system. And we'll kind of talk about why these are placed in a second. So what you'll see here is you'll have an incision in the skin kind of down here in the chest area, and then you'll tunnel through and place the catheter. And you see the catheter, the dotted line here represents kind of the tunneled or subcutaneous portion of the catheter. So traveling here, it's not traveling through any vascular structure. Then it enters the vein here, and travels through the uh, vein at this point all the way here and still terminates in the central venous system here, uh, in this case at the cavoatrial junction of the SVC and right atrium. These can be used when they're tunneled. They can be used for uh, much longer periods of time because they're more secure. They're usually more comfortable for patients. Uh, you can go months to years with these uh, catheters, actually. Some advantages, again, they're more ideal for long-term administration. They're more comfortable for patients. Some examples of these are a perm cath, which is often used for dialysis or uh, plasmapheresis. Another example is a trifusion catheter, which we actually show here. You can see the three different ports to give three different medications at once. So the indications for the tunneled central venous catheter are very similar to the non-tunneled as well. Again, if you're giving medications such as chemo or antibiotics, very com these are very commonly placed in uh, cancer patients that need long-term chemotherapy. If you're giving blood products, uh, fluids, Again, access for dialysis or plasmapheresis. So as far as contraindications go, there's an absolute contraindication you definitely want to pay attention to for tunneled central venous catheters specifically. And that is if the patient is bacteremic or septic, you do not want to place a tunneled catheter because it's a more invasive procedure and you are at risk of, of the catheter getting infected and then it needs to be removed. And that's a much more involved process than, say, removing a vascath or a, uh, a non-tunneled line or a, or a pick line. And so an alternative would be is you, you know, you could place a pick line or a non-tunneled catheter uh, until the infection clears. And then at that point, once the infection clears, then you could place a tunneled catheter if this is a patient that's going to need central venous access for a very long period of time. If the patient has a skin infection or cellulitis at the access site, again, you don't want to place a tunnel catheter there. You want to go to a different site. Uh, and again, if they have an allergy to the catheter material, relative contraindications are irreversible coagulopathy, and central vein occlusion. A tunnel catheter is cuffed or uncuffed. So a cuff is around the catheter placed near the tunnel entry point. So it's kind of at this more proximal portion here, and you can see this in the diagram here. It's made of Dacron, and which is kind of this soft material that allows tissue to grow over this cuff over time. So the tissue kind of grows around here in this diagram, as you can see, and further secures it and actually even blocks off and kind of forms a physical barrier uh, here to the tunnel as well. As far as uh, the indications for a cuff or uncuff, it's kind of uh, both the ordering clinician's preference or the uh, interventional radiologist placing this catheter, their preference. It increases the stability of the catheter. It can help with that. It also, like I said, creates this physical barrier. So some people like that because it can help prevent bacteria from entering the skin tunnel and creating an infection in here, which would be a significant complication that would require having to remove this catheter. The big thing, though, is it's important to know if the catheter is cuffed when removing it, because if you're removing it, you need to use an, an instrument and kind of use some blunt dissection and pull this soft tissue off the cuff, and then you can remove the catheter. If it's a, an uncuffed catheter, you can just cut the suture and uh, pull the catheter out as you would, but if it's cuffed, you can't just pull it out. You have to dissect around and then pull it out. Now, ports, 
These are totally implanted central venous catheters. So everything you see here is completely inside the patient. Uh, there's no external catheter segments. So this port here is completely subcutaneous and it has this soft surface that can be easily penetrated with a needle. And these are used for long-term therapy. And an example of that would be, you know, months to years. And very often these are used by chemotherapy patients, for example, that require, you know, frequent uh, chemotherapy sessions. And a port is actually able to withstand up to 2,000 needle punctures. So you can use a port frequently and, and many times over a long period of time. And again, these are also often more comfortable for patients. You know, there's no external segment kind of uh, hanging out here or anything like that. It's completely within the subcutaneous tissue. And some examples of this are a port calf And we're going to actually dedicate a separate video to ports because it's a you know, commonly done procedure. And you know, they have some unique uh, indications and aspects to the, the placement of ports. Thank you again for watching this video from Benchmark IR. Be sure to like the video and subscribe to our channel. And be sure to check out part two of Venus Access by clicking the link in the description below.